Hello and welcome to Cartel Aristocrats cast number 141. This cast is always is sponsored by CoolStuffInc.com. With free shipping on orders of $100 or more and a sweet 25% buy list bonus, CoolStuffInc.com is the store for all of your Magic the Gathering needs. How are you guys doing this week? I'm okay. Uh, not doing as good as you since you're on vacation, but you know, some of us live the... Uh, middle class life, and some of us don't. Ed? Uh, I can barely breathe. Life is great. And which, where are you right now? I am in Portland. Well, At, congrats. Like, my house. Yeah, glad to hear it. Um, not much has happened this week. We have a... Uh, a conclusion to War of the Spark, the Mythic Edition, if people want to get into that. Um, it looks like a week later, orders are finally being shipped with tracking, or um, not at all, and they've been canceled. We also had the first uh, Star City event this week. Did anyone watch that and see what was going on for the new standard format? Uh, I watched some of it. It was a lot of the things you would have expected. Uh, a lot of people playing Mono Red, a lot of people playing Esper. Um, the Nexus of Fate decks were just as obnoxious as they've always been. Uh, Tamiyo seems to give them a lot more staying power. It's a permanent that can help them um, power through their deck to get more Nexus of Fates uh, due to the fact... Or, or whatever card they're missing. So like, it could also help you find Search for Kanta. It can help you find uh reclamation so or wilderness reclamation um and the fact that it mills you a bunch is actually just all upside because it fills your graveyard to uh allow search for us can to flip faster it removes cards from your deck so that eventually you have a much higher density of uh nexus of fates left so you're less likely to fizzle um it is it, may, it helps the deck get closer to deterministic in terms of winning but uh, you can still sit there if you want to watch your opponent try to kill you. Uh, it'll just take forever. And that's kind of miserable to watch. Uh, there was one match in particular where the first game was, I think, one person took five turns or six turns, and the other person took, like, 38 turns or something silly like that because he just didn't concede when he was dead. And that's not very good for uh, coverage. So that's unfortunate that that happened. But it looks like the there are there are ways to combat it. Um, Teferi, basically, like the small one. I don't remember the name of the, the subtitle of that one. The the three mana Teferi's ability uh, basically makes the wilderness reclamation not do anything, which is great. Um, if there are more aggressive decks that are playing blue and white, so like if you had the Blue white aggro deck, you could play some Teferis in that deck and have a lot of game against Nexus decks, even if you're not the fastest out of the gate. Um, and then, you don't know, like Twitter's debating about whether or not you should play Experimental Frenzy or Chandra. The, I don't I don't know the names of any of these things. The new Chandra, the four mana one. Um, which one of those is better in your deck? Well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do and depends on what people, what answers people are playing. There's not a lot of cards that kill enchantments and planeswalkers. So, um, I don't know. It doesn't look like a whole lot has changed. Ed, did you watch any of this or were you busy with other finance stuff? Uh, no, I actually watched, I had a decent amount of day two going on in the um, background. So I watched what I could. I wasn't, um, necessarily paying attention the whole time, but again, it was it was always there. It was mostly playing. I did see most of the top eight. Um, I think for the most part, standard is fine. Um, we definitely have very much... I, I don't necessarily want to say it's solved, but it seems like the meta is very quickly solved into a very typical rock, paper, scissors meta. Um, the mono red aggro decks, the gruel aggro decks, they seem to be very, very good against the uh, Nexus of Fate decks. The Nexus of Fate decks seems to be very good against the mid range decks and the mid range decks that have, like, the moment of cravings, ways to deal with, uh, with creatures coming out of the gate quickly and as uh, finding ways to mitigate damage. They seem to do obviously pretty well against the, 
um, aggro decks. Um, I think this is more or less where standard is. I think the fact that it's pretty open seems um, seems fine. Nexus, the numbers, uh, there's probably slightly more Nexus decks than what people want. Um, I think it was, I think the the numbers show that it was the most played deck on day two, despite the fact that it didn't have any uh, copies in the top eight. Um, I'm okay with the, with the deck uh, being the way it is. Um, I think the fact that people aren't scooping to a deterministic kill is a little problematic. I'm not really sure that there's a good remedy to that. Um, people's, uh, people's primary issue with eggs was that it was technically not deterministic. Um, or rather, I guess the original iteration was the second Sunrise decks. Uh, um, the KCI deck was deterministic. Yeah, people somehow didn't sell scoops to that. I think this is pretty much the same way. Um, I think someone, I think one of the matches, I think it was Jerry Jerry Thompson and Brian Gottlieb commentating on it. I think they had described the kill as being deterministic in the sense that uh, the Nexus player will go through his deck. There will be a point in the, there, there will be a game state where there's only four cards remaining in his library and those are all Nexus fates. And he can play in such a way where the um, the one of Callus something it's the, unco- the new uncommon war the spark it bounces Callus dismissal Callus dismissal it bounces a non permanent to your return target uh, non then permanent to its owner's hand uh, a mass one and they'll continue to do this they'll chain they'll basically bounce all the permanents and then swing with an obnoxiously large zombie army um, that seems pretty deterministic there's unless you actually have a way to respond. Um, at some point, it feels like you can basically, very similar to, um, like a mind slaver lock or eggs, you can say that I'm going to demonstrate these series of actions, and then you basically just are trying to get to the end game as quickly as possible. The fact that people don't want to scoop, that is technically their right, uh, the rules say that you don't have to scoop at any time. The fact that people don't want to scoop is, I think, more problematic than the deck itself. Is there yeah. anything financial from that though that we can learn really? Or we is it just like more like does finance apply at all when it comes to how players feel when playing against certain things or not really? Uh, I definitely think that there's like that that's definitely a thing to consider. Um if you're trying to get buy cards for more than the short term uh decks that people don't like playing against. I don't want to say are more likely to get banned, but more likely to get looked at and may become less good in the future. So if this deck is, is, is as miserable to play against as it is currently for, let's say, the next month, and people don't really find a way to like deal with it in such a way that people stop playing the deck, like there are two things that happen. is is A deck is so obnoxious and good that it's just the best thing that can happen and the best thing in the format which happened with the teamer energy deck um during amonkhet block or people adapt and they they play decks that are good against it and then it's like kind of like a seasonal thing where like this week it's not good but next week it'll be better when people stop playing cards that are good against it it's kind of like what dredge was and affinity and like all those all those archetypes in modern that you can tell more clearly and more easily when they're good and when they're bad because of how much sideboard cards people play against it. So, like, when there's not a lot of graveyard hate, dredge is much better. But when there is a lot of graveyard hate, dredge is much worse. For example, that, I mean, that's not a perfect analogous, but if people are playing, you know, four main deck little teferis and main deck counter spells like negates or something, the simic decks is going to be much worse. The next decks are just going to be worse as a result. If people are playing less of those cards, then they'll be better. But how long it takes people to do that and to adapt their lists is not something that I can really attest to. But what that'll probably do is drive the prices of the newer cards, especially in different ways. So, like, the only new... Well, there's two new cards out of this set that are uh, featured in this deck, and that's Blast Zone and Tamiyo Collector of Tales, because I like one and looked up the name of it. And those cards are not like particularly expensive at the moment, but could creep up in the future if they 
have a good showing for a week or two in a row, or people at their LGS decide that it's finally time to drop money on Nexus of Fate, or they can crater because you know Nexus of Fate gets banned, or Re Widow Instructor Mission gets banned, or something like that. I'm not saying that that's necessarily what's going to happen, but you have to take that into account when you're holding cards. It's like, what can make these cards better and therefore more valuable, and what can make these cards worse and therefore less valuable, and how does how likely are those scenarios to happen? Uh, I think that there's a non-zero chance to think something gets banned. I also think that there's a non-zero chance that the format just evolves in such a way that the deck's not very good. It's the first week, really, of of a new standard format because they didn't play standard at the Pro Tour. So honestly, I don't think I'd worry about it all that much. Great explanation. Anything you want to add to that, Ed? I don't think so. I think the the part that Jim uh, summarized the best was that this is week one. What's good? What's good right now will probably be very, very different than what will be good in two weeks. Um, this is kind of the nature of new formats. People kind of settle in with what they're comfortable with. I don't. I don't think there was a lot of. Um, innovation as it were a lot of uh a lot of the decks were more or less um decks that had already existed plus a few updates uh you know mono red was the entire shell was already there now people are just adding in genre, uh as a substitution for experimental frenzy uh the nexus deck was already there people just have tamio as a new tool to uh mill faster with a bit more utility um, the Esper control decks, you had Esper Acuity, you basically had some variation of the mid-range slash control deck. Now you just have another Teferi as a fairly powerful tool. Um, but again, there's nothing that was really new. I think once the meta shapes itself out a little bit, people have time to kind of adjust to the prices. And now that there's, there's you know, three cards with targets on their head, people will be able to adapt that going forward. And I do suspect that there will be cards that are probably still under the radar right now that will probably be more expensive in a week or two once people have a very grasp of the meta. Yeah, and speaking of uh, price fluctuations, do you want to talk for a second about what's been going on with Japanese uh, War of the Spark Finance? with uh, people getting up in arms about booster box pricing and what's happening to the pricing of foils and, and sealed product, Ed? Uh, um, I guess in short, uh, I think they grossly underestimated how much uh, demand there would be for this. Um, the way that the set is printed... Um, some of the cards are, even though it's advertised that uh, roughly half the packs, the Planeswalkers, will have alternate art in the Japanese boxes, um, it's actually more than twice as rare. It does, it, it's, not, it's not really an intuitive thing to say, but part of it has to do with how uh, the print runs work. Um, but in short, it's very, very possible that you open up a box that doesn't have an alternate art Mythic Planeswalker, um, which is part of the reason why the Liliana one is so expensive. There's obviously several reasons. Uh, the art itself, uh, the fact that the card itself is very powerful. I think Jim had um, mentioned on previous podcasts that um, previous episode uh, that this th it was probably a reasonable card to pre-order in the event that the card does become good. It's going to be quite expensive. Um, it didn't see a ton of play. It obviously it was um, a very very good finisher in the Esper decks. There were some like Demir decks that uh, it was basically the top end of the deck. Um, but the card alone is uh, just the English normal copy is I think like twenty five ish dollars when I last looked twenty five twenty eight dollars. Um, so if again if you factor in the fact that you get them in half the boxes or uh, you get them half as often in the Japanese boxes. That should probably put it in the uh, 60-ish range. And then the fact that it's only available in, in Japanese and the art itself probably pushes people who don't who wouldn't necessarily buy the card itself 
are now buying the card because of the unique art, and that is basically what's pushing the non full copy to like a hundred dollars. Um, there's a huge shortage of boxes in Japan. Uh, there were stores that were actually tr- offering to buy boxes um, very close to MSRP prices from people um, because of how much demand there was and the fact that they just didn't order enough to make all their customers happy. Um, foils are all over the place. Some foils are very, very expensive. I know a lot of people have reached out to me trying to buy foils, either the pre-release copies or the pack foils. Um, I've been trying to I've been trying to get back to people as much as I can, but again, there's a lot more demand than what I think what uh, Wizards had originally anticipated. Um, the reprint for the boxes itself is not due uh, until much later this month. Um. And a lot of the places in the U.S. distribution was very, very low. Um, and uh, when you when you factor that in with um, with how rare the Planeswalkers are, um, they're definitely going to be very, very hard to come by in the U.S. for uh, for the immediate future until more product comes out. Um, so I think people who are wanting it now they're definitely paying a premium premium on it uh the japanese cards group people have started posting what they've opened a lot of japanese sellers um have started to do that as well um i know a lot of people are reluctant to buy cards from overseas um so there's like right now there's just no real good way to get it uh uh to make these readily available for, for, for people Yeah, I've just sort of noticed that on um, social media lately with uh, some people saying it's a scam that shops are charging more than $100 for a box. And at the same time, there's people that are saying just wait for supply to eventually percolate into the states and for prices to go down. So we'll see. Uh, so I mean, the sorry, go ahead. The, so the stores are actually trying to buy list the boxes. They're paying approximately $120 per box. That's it. That is their buy list number. So you can only imagine what what they have to be selling at if that's how much they're paying. Right. But th- what I'm saying is you're seeing a backlash in America of people saying, oh, how dare they charge us for this much? But, you know, if the boxes weren't going for a lot in Japan, then you could make money flying them back, right? But if Japanese shops are catching on, then they're, you're obviously not going to see low prices until we get to the next wave of uh boxes printed because it's print to demands after all or apparently it's print to demand i mean there's there's like a lot more to unpack here like the the thing is that americans or even just like north americans in general or south americans europeans places where like japanese uh seal product is not readily available are not the only people that want them. And it's hard to like fault the shop for selling something for less than what, like it's, it's hard for it's hard to say that they should sell something for less than what's inside of it. Sometimes that's a little bit like, it's not always the case that, that, that that's unfair, but like, Given how much demand there is for this, it's, it it might as well be a limited print run set. Like at the, at the current point in time, it feels a lot more like a master set in terms of like availability. Like you just can't get this stuff; it just doesn't exist. People don't have it. What are you supposed to do if you do have it? Well, you can either sell it for a lot right now, or you can, you know, hold it and it'll be worth less later. I, I'm not sure that you're there's really a reason to sell it for less than what the going market rate is. If you're willing to wait, then that's fine. You can get it for cheaper later, but the set of these planeswalkers is just so expensive. I don't, it it means even if you can find them, because a lot of them are, even if you go on the websites that will ship to the United States, uh, for example, or just internationally, they just don't have very many of them in stock. Like if you're looking for, especially the rare or the mythic ones, it's just, it's just so hard to find them. Uh, I, I really don't think that there's any reason that any shop at this point should sell them for less than 
what they're worth. And if you don't agree with that, then you can wait. But, you know, I just did a quick, some quick math. A full set, one of each of the Japanese planeswalkers ordered from uh, a vendor that will ship from Japan to any, I assume any international location is $360, which if you don't, like, I thought I was getting a, uh, not a good, as good of a deal, but I was just saving a lot of aggravation by ordering a set through Ed. But now that I see how much they are now, it seems so silly. Like, I don't know. I, I didn't think that they would be quite as rare as they are. And I don't think that people thought that was going to be the case either. But there's going to be more of them. And there's especially going to be more of them in the United States, right? Like, is the promo packs for the next set, which granted is another like two and a half months out, uh, will have these planeswalkers in them. But you can't deny that the collectability makes a lot of people interested, especially people that wouldn't have otherwise played with them. Like, I'm saying, like, I would not have bought a Kaya or a Jaya or a Vraska or Sama. Like, I wouldn't have bought any of these Planeswalkers just by themselves from Japan. I bought them because they had sweet alternate art. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of people like that. Like, even I've seen some artists on Twitter that are magic artists looking to purchase the Liliana because you know that's like one of their idols did the art for that it's you know it's just a, such an iconic person that you really can't put a price on something like that it's just a once in a lifetime kind of thing so i don't know i, I think that like a lot of times i'll agree with players that like things are too expensive and shops maybe charge too much money for some things uh but i don't think this is one of those cases i think that if you just wait you'll eventually get it and if you don't, then complete the Wizards of the Coast. They should have printed, they should have distributed more of this product internationally, I think is the problem. Anything else you want to add, Ed, before we move on to pick, uh, sorry, our credit winner? Um, it makes me sound particularly unsympathetic, but I would argue that what U.S. players are perceiving as being unfair here is no different than people who uh, are overseas and they have to deal with customs and import fees on Mythic Edition. Um, we're paying the premium to get product from Japan and in such a way that they basically have to deal with a premium on product, on basically all other products that, uh, that we more or less take for granted. Um, if you go overseas, you'll find that booster boxes especially in Europe and Canada, boxes are much, much more expensive than they are here. Um, I want to say people who had to deal with Mythic Editions, I want to say they paid such a high premium on ordering through the uh, Hasbro store uh, for Ravnica Allegiance that their import, uh, after they paid shipping and import fees, it was quite literally cheaper for them to order either just the singles from TCG Player or order from the second market, even with a premium price, uh, e even with a premium priced in than it was to order through Hasbro. Cause again, just paying just all these fees that are associated with it just adds up very, very quickly. So again, I'm, I, I, sh I'm not particularly sympathetic as much as it makes me sound like a dick, um, to say that, but. Oh, you are. Don't worry. But that's why people listen to you because um, you're smart this is again this is just what americans are basically just getting a bit a bit of a taste of what um people overseas have to deal with i basically almost every set release and they have to pay import fees on top of that most of the time all right jim what's our credit winner for the week so conveniently while we're talking about mythic editions our winner this week is ryan edwards who says uh, for those planning to sell the Mythic Edition 3 singles, do you have any suggestion on which ones to sell, which ones to hold? Uh, I hope to recover and reuse the initial capital sooner than later, while sitting on those that I suspect will be longer-term gainers. Uh, personally, I think that you are best served holding all of them if you want to hold all of them, or selling all of them if you want to get rid of them. I don't think that there's any particularly good reason to hold one over another. Um, I don't think that they will grow faster or slower than each other. I think that just given the availability of the the set, it's like given the availability of the cars themselves, they will not be any rarer than any other ones. And I don't think that they'll grow in a different pattern. Um, it, I mean, 
there's also the possibility for that like some of these that have been printed less often may be reprinted again and the thus the foil pricing will go down a little bit but not very much um for example ugin the spear dragon has not had a reprint in a booster set since uh feet reforge which was the first set it was in so if this is included in like a master style set or a battle bond style set it could be much less expensive since there are more versions of it available but there's also the flip side of it's still a very good card with very iconic art and it's possible that it still retains most of its value going forward so i, I don't think that there's a particularly strong case for you to keep any cards if you're planning to sell any of them just sell all of them or keep all of them don't do we don't do one or the other Uh, so I actually disagree on that. Um, I think there's multiple parts to this. I think uh, a large amount of people who purchase this are either purchasing it um, with the intention of only keeping some. Um, I don't think there's that many EDH players or people who have a cube out there that necessarily have a home for all eight of these cards. I think a lot of people are looking to subsidize their copy either by, if they only purchase one, by selling some of these and then just keeping the ones they want to play with or um or if they did purchase two copies and they would just sell the, the second copy the second full full copy to pay for the first copy um so i think um either saying that you have to hold it all or sell it all it might not necessarily be incorrect obviously that's dependent on what people's goals are it won't surprise me if people were looking simply to just you know, sell the Jace if that covers eighty. It, if you paid two hundred fifty dollars plus whatever shipping and sales tax, where let's say like two eighty three hundred or something, and then you sell the Jace for one fifty two hundred, I think that's it's it's not a bad spot to to have paid a hundred dollars for all the remaining amount of the Planeswalkers. Um, that being said, I also think that some of the Planeswalkers actually do appreciate better. I think some of them are doomed in terms of um, in terms of how much demand they had. I think like Duretti, for example, um, in the second one, first one. Uh, regardless, um, Duretti is probably the card is a, a type of card where the price won't actually recover because it doesn't see a lot of play relative to its supply. Um, the uh, the prior to its reprint, the price was higher because it was uh, one-time printing, um, and uh, in a relatively small supplemental set in Conspiracy Two. Um, whereas, if you look at something like Elspeth uh, Night Air, that card has um, is actually trended upwards slightly uh, since it's been printing. I want to say that it was uh, it was sold for like seventy-five to eighty dollars when it first came out, and now it's like it's pushing a hundred. And that's a type of card where even though there's two printings of it, I think, uh, two or three printings of it, um, three. Yeah, the original, yeah, the original Masters and Dual Deck, that's right. Um, it uh, it continues to go up because it sees a lot of play. The last reprint, has it's been quite some time since there's actually been a true reprint for it. And I think um, there's certainly a lot more demand for the card. I do think that's the type of card we'll, that will slowly increase over time i think jason mind sculptor is kind of in that same boat there'll be a lot of people who will sell them now the price will stay relatively low and then there'll always be people who like the art best they want to play three in their legacy deck or two in their legacy deck so that means that they'll have to hunt additional copies or whatever um i think there are a few in that category it's it's hard to say for certain which ones are the long-term gainers but um I think if there's a few that you'd want to use, uh, it's not necessarily the worst idea to hold on to them. I would suggest looking at something like EDH Rec or MTG Top 8 um, as a way to just kind of gauge the popularity of each Planeswalker. And you can use that to determine which ones you want to hold for long term and which ones you just want to turn over quickly. I agree with Ed. I don't think anyone, a lot of people who bought into this product have money to wait for the prices of this to mature. I think they all want to flip it fast for quick money, which is fine. But if you can afford to not sell right away, you're going to make way more money down the road. And I think that's worth the time to sit on it. 
I don't really have anything else to add. I agree with Ed here. Okay. Well, Ryan, you can send me a email at cartelaristocrats at gmail.com and I'll get you your $25 gift certificate to coolstuffinc.com. If you'd like to win next week, you can send an email or sorry, you can leave a question on the coolstuffinc.com page that should go up the day after this cast. And if your question gets selected, you can win $25 of coolstuffinc.com store credit. Uh, so before we get into pick of the week, I forgot that we should probably talk about this a little bit. Um, my, uh, War of the Spark was not legal for the most recent uh, Mythic Championship, but a lot of cards have started to trend up in Modern especially because of the Neoform combo deck that people are playing. Uh, what are your strategies to to deal with this specifically? Like, How are you reacting to it? Uh, so just to put it in the context, anyone who's not familiar with what Jim is talking about, it's basically the most recent iteration of the, uh, Grishel brand deck. Uh, it's function is, uh, the reason this deck now exists as opposed to before was, um, the card Neoform, which is, uh, it's basically birthing pot on sorcery. It's green, blue, it's a sorcery, uh, you sacrifice a creature, uh, you sacrifice a creature, and then you search for a creature with convert mana cost plus one from your library and point of play. Um, so the deck functions by uh, by trying to power out... Um, uh, the, rather, there's two parts of the combo that uh, you need to work. Uh, you want Neoform, obviously, uh, and your target on Neoform is Alistair Rider, which is the cycle of Cold Snap uh, rares that allow you to pitch two cards that match that color from your hand. And if you do, you can play that card for free. Um, the black one is Soul Spike. The red one is Fear of the Horde. The blue one is Commandeer. I don't know what the white one is. And the green one is Alistair Rider. Uh, Alistair Rider is a seven... Uh, Sorry, I just want to interrupt you. Isn't the white one the Wrath of God? I don't know the name of it. It's like pitch two white cards into Wrath. I'm going to go look it up while you're talking. All right. Uh, so Alistair Rider is a seven cover mana cost. You pitch two green cards, you put to play for free. Um, if you play Neoform, uh, you sacrifice that, you get you get Gristlebrand. You put Gristlebrand in play, uh, you you pay life, you pay seven, 14 life, etc. You draw Nourishing Shoal, and you draw Autochron, Autochron Worm, which is one of the cards that has spiked as a result. Um, you pitch those, you gain more life, um, and then eventually you just kill them uh, once once you basically have them play. Uh, a lot of people tweet about it. It kills on turn one an unreasonable amount of time, which is basically any, because turn one kills don't really exist in modern. Um, and it kills on turn two probably, like, most of the time. It's very, very hard to fizzle um, with a deck once you kind of get to that stage. Um and as a result, a lot of the cards have already spiked. Uh, Chancellor Tangle is a big one. That is the one that if you have in your open hand, you reveal it, it put, uh, and you add green mana to your mana pool. That's basically how you're getting the turn one kills. Usually it starts out with revealing that from your hand. Um, Allosaur Rider has also seen a spike. And I think there's another card. Autocron Worm um, has also seen a spike since you're gaining 14 life. That's technically the biggest one that you can uh, pitch in a nourishing shoal. Um, I think the deck is a little bit too fragile. It's definitely very good. I think once people um, are more aware of it, it I'm actually not really sure how you fight it, to be honest. But I think a lot. it's one of those things where it's kind of a moto-only deck. It hasn't really made its way to paper yet, obviously, because War of Spark has only been legal this weekend. Um, so this hasn't really seen much... It hasn't really gotten much visibility yet outside of the people who play Magic Online who are grinding the leagues and trying to um, abuse the deck, basically. So the thing that I've seen that I think is quite amusing is uh, people are trying to combat this by playing Disrupting Shoal and Commandeer because you can pitch a Commandeer to a Disrupting Shoal to counter Allosaurus Rider, but you can also Commandeer the Allosaurus Rider or disrupting Shoal, the Neo form, in order to stop yourself from dying. I don't think Commandeer works against Alistair Rider, right? Because there's no point where they have to give you priority. 
right? Because Neo Form is as an additional cost. So if you play Alsor Rider, it resolves, and then you still have priority. You play Neo Form right away. No, no, isn't ca commandeer is uh oh, it's non creature spell. JK. Oh, you can commandeer the the Neo Form. So commandeer is not a uh, it, it's not a it's not a control magic. It steals a spell. So like if they cast Neo Form and you commandeer it, then you resolve the Neo Form. Am I thinking of a different card? Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Commandeer comment uh, is, uh, is five blue blue. You may exile two blue cards from your hand rather than pay its mana cost. And its text is gain control of non target non creature spell. You may choose new targets for it. So you, you just steal their neo form from them. Interesting. Okay. I, I clearly think of Commandeer as a different card. But... Yeah, and the, the white card part of the set was called Sun Scour, and it was pitched to white card. Oh. Yep. Yep. Oh. Destroy non-land permanents. Yeah. No, it's just destroy all creatures. All right. Sorry, I'm thinking of Soul Scour. Yes, Sun Sun Scour, which is not Soul Scour, is the other card in the cult. Listen, we're we're just card nerds. We just want to talk about the whole cycle because you got to know them all, right? Yeah, but we should talk about pick of the week. Okay, fine. Jeremy, what's your pick of the week? Man, uh, the Marriott loyalty program. But uh, in reality, um, I still like Fatal Push, and it continues to drop. And I called this like a month ago. Um, it seems like we still haven't found the floor. It's fallen like another 50 cents. Uh, that's not my pick of the week, but it, I know I called it, and I think I want to go deeper now that um, uh, the price of that continues to fall. So I think it's a pretty profitable investment if uh, you can get enough um, copies. Uh, my pick of the week is the Scorpion God, which I feel like we've talked about again as well. Um, it should be worth more than like a than a bulker slash a dollar. And then a similar vein, Ghoul Caller Gisa is starting to rise because of more zombies. Um, it's still under a dollar, but this is a penny stock that could easily pay dividends in the future. Sorry, Gisa and Giralf, not Ghoul Caller Gisa. Yeah, it's okay. like, I don't think that that one's very cheap. That one's the commander-only one. Yeah, that's yeah. Like the 2014 I, I, one. Yeah, that's like old as sin in magic terms. That's my that's my bad, sorry. And also like $20, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's quite expensive. So, Ed, what's your freak of the week? Uh, I'm just going to keep it real simple this week. I think Chromatic Lantern is uh, is definitely a winner here. Um, it was a card that, uh, when it got reprinted, it dropped very quickly. And then it basically it just has just started to rebound constantly. Um it has an unbelievably fast turnover time. You basically sell them as fast as you list them. I imagine that Jeremy can attest to this as well, how quickly they sell out in his shop with a bunch Which of card? players. Chromatic Lantern? Ah, uh, yes. We sell them for 18... No, I'm kidding. Remember the Heliod thing? That was great last year. Um, we've been selling them between 3 to $5, depending on the edition and condition, and we never have more than a play set of any in stock, even if I go over to Japan and bring them all back. Yeah, this is the card that now it's effectively out of print since no one is opening up Guilds of Ravnica anymore since a set that was, you know, six months old might as well be alpha, basically. Um, this I think this is a card that it's more or less bottomed out. Um, it just has it just has so much demand. There's It basically goes in every ADH deck. Um, everyone wants it. It's relatively affordable. No one's really priced out of owning them. Um, so I definitely see plenty of orders where people are buying three or four or something just to put one each of their decks. Um, and I think this is the type of card that it will only continue to go up a bit slowly, but it will continue to go up as time goes on. Um, you won't be getting rich off of this, but if you need them for your deck, I'd buy them now. If you don't care and you just want to own like 20 copies and toss them in a box or something, it won't surprise me if these are like $10 by December or something. I like that. I, I agree with all the things you say there. EDH players are notorious black holes for magic cards. Chromatic Lantern is just like Soul Ring. We'll go infinity decks and 
you can print it infinity times and it'll still be worth three to five dollars. So yeah, I, I agree. That's that's a pretty good pick. Uh, my pick this week is Chandra Fire Artisan, which is the one from War of the Spark. Uh, it's a rare, which makes it different as a planeswalker, but it's only three dollars right now. And even it's though it's five dollars now. Oh, right? okay. I think it just went up. I mean, still at five dollars, I don't think that that's unreasonable to to buy in. Uh, I'll look it up just to be sure. I was looking at something. No, it's four dollars. Get out of here. Oh, I'm sorry. It went down one whole dollar, but it's going up. You're onto something here. Yeah. Well, so here's here's my thought: is like mono red, like aggro decks are just going to be good forever and ever and ever. And uh, experimental frenzy is fine, but it, it, there's a lot more easy ways to deal with it, uh, and a lot of them also gain a bunch of life. So. I think that people will probably look towards playing Chandra in the future. Uh, Frenzy is more explosive and more powerful, but Chandra is definitely a lot harder to get rid of, especially in, mere, in places where there's creatures, because you basically can't attack her. Unlike a lot of other Planeswalkers, she's going to do a ton of damage to you, and that's just not where you want... Not, not the kind of removal you want to deal with. Like it's, it's not what you want to be doing when you're playing against a, a red aggressive deck. So uh, I think Chandra Fire Artisan could easily be like an eight to ten dollar card for a couple of weeks uh if mono red continues to perform well and i don't see any reason why i wouldn't all right so where can people find us uh i'm ed you guys can find me on twitter at edwin13 uh after a long stretch there's gps in the u.s again so i'll be in gp madison this weekend uh, behind the tales of venture booth a lot of people have reached out to me. Anyone who wants Japanese War of the Spark cards, I will have them um, behind the booth um, and available. Uh, no sealed products, but I think we should have the majority of um, the single, the ultra art singles out there. Both non-foil sets, um, foils, and pre-release foils as well. Um, other than that, I think there is a fairly long stretch where I'll be doing shows. I think next week is off, and then I think it's four or five shows in a row in the U.S. All right. My name is Jim Kasai. You can find me on Twitter at phrost underscore. You can find me, uh, my articles on coolstuffinc.com. Uh, you can find me at Pokemon Go Fest at Chicago uh, next month. Uh, and you can find me on this lovely podcast. I'm Jeremy. You can find me on Twitter at Missouri MTG. You can find our podcast at cartel underscore finance on Twitter. Thanks for dealing with my audio issues this week, guys. You know, it's a rough life recording from the Ritz Carlton in Hawaii. Real, real rough life. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening. Jim, you want to do the outro this week? Uh, I'm not going to grease you with any puns. I'm just going to thank you all for listening and joining us for 141 episodes. That's a lot. Even though they're not like technically always weekly, that's still a lot of Magic the Gathering. Way more than I thought it would. So enjoy the rest of your week, and I hope you have a good one.